Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. To kick off, could you tell us where sort of Tenacious Ventures came from? What do you invest in? What do you look for? What's that, what's that secret sauce? Yeah. I mean, I guess for me, it's been a 10 year plus journey that started with harvesting tomatoes with my hands in South America, which is not somewhere I ever thought I'd find myself, but I, I ended up on an accidental gap year um, in South America and uh, what was quite literally harvesting fruit um, and just got immersed in agriculture, uh, ended up staying for a year nearly and traveling around mostly on farms and amidst agriculture. And it just clicked for me that the food system was undergoing massive transformation, that technology was going to play a huge role in that, climate was going to play a huge role in that. and. I guess it was a like do good and do well opportunity, which for me was really exciting because my parents had always said, go make money, then do something good for the world. And the idea that you could harness the power of the private sector to change the world and bring in technology and business was super exciting. And so I had a sort of meandering path from there through advisory and consulting and working in a couple operating roles until I said, actually, the real gap, especially in Australia, is on the funding side. And, and Matthew, my co-founder, and I had really come to the, that same conclusion that Australia needed a dedicated agri-food firm, needed to look through the climate lens, needed to be high conviction. And so that was tenacious. So we invest along the ag and food value chain with a climate impact lens, a kind of non-concessionary returns focus, and all early stage. So yeah, that's us. I love that. I love the accidental. Did, did you have a family history in, in ag or farming? No, uh, a lot of time in the woods and dad bought a hobby farm when I was, I think I was 12. And so we spent time there, spent time there as a kid, spent time outside. It's truly hobby farm. Like I always joke with, he grows rocks and squirrels. So it's, it's, not, it's not commercial at all, um, but did spend time there. So maybe inkling, but more on the environmental kind of conservation side than anything like production ag. Yeah, fantastic. And what sort of ventures has Tenacious invested in so far? Yeah, so we're we've got 14 investments in the portfolio all along the value chain. We, we think about different thematics that are represent systems change in agri-food from like sustainable protein, whether that's animals or plants or alternatives through to embedded finance and, and natural capital, but it roughly breaks down to pre-farm gate through to pre-consumer. So that means like green ammonia, sort of novel fertilizers, pest management. We look at carbon and natural capital or in livestock genetics, packaging replacements, waste management, on-farm autonomy and robotics. So pretty broad across the value chain. And you would have heard from that kind of brief example or overview, not just software. So one of our big beliefs is that you can't eat software. And so you can't only invest in software if you want to invest in the future of agri-food. And just to give a, a sense for the for the listeners, size of you, you've got two funds now. You've got a first and a second fund, and is that right? So we got a first fund. We're raising our second fund. We'll start deploying first half of next year, and we roughly check sizes are probably a couple hundred k up to a million, million and change as an entry point. Forty percent first check, sixty percent reserve for follow on. Great. You you've written a, a series called fundraising out loud, which. As emerging managers ourselves, as I think it's more fundraising, screaming out loud, <laughs> because it can be a, a bit of a challenge. What, what are some of the things you wish you knew when you first got into this game? I I think I wonder about this actually. If I knew everything I knew now, would you do it? I think that's a really tough question some days. I feel like you'd have to take 300 meetings to raise fund one, and you think fund two will be less, but it probably won't. Would you do it? But I think I think you would, right? For us, it comes down to the mission and the belief in, in the sector and the companies, and that's just kind of part of the process. For me, it was a honestly a really steep learning curve on all the finance jargon and, and that whole industry. And so I would find myself, I still do sometimes, but much less so in meetings where I just literally didn't know what investors were saying. Go, oh, so who runs your distributions and what's the allocation strategy and the denominator effect of the, and I'm like, I just, I, I don't even understand the words you're saying. I can't even hand wave my way through this because I just like, literally have no idea what you're saying. So some of that stuff, you could imagine it's there, there is a language that once you speak it, it gets much easier because the other people speak it too. I think it's been an important part of the journey to say what are our strengths and what do we bring to the table and knowing those things are things we can learn and have learned. And I think that's kind of part of our ethos too, but that's, that's definitely one that comes to mind. Yeah. As, as a learning. I, w I was going to ask whether fund two was going to be much easier than fund one, but I think you've just answered that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting, right? We thought that when we raised fund one, we 
had more than a PowerPoint, but not much more than a PowerPoint, right? We had a track record of advising companies and we had opportunity flow, we had operating experience. Mackey's one of few exited founders in the space, but we didn't have a portfolio to look at. We didn't have a track record in that sense. And so we thought once we have built a portfolio and it's doing well, and we have example companies and a whole back office and reports, and it's going to be way easier, but it turns out market conditions really matter. <laughs> and so raising a fund in 2020 was very different than raising a fund in 2023. And so we'll see what, what we say is easier and not easier. We also last time were raising a fund while we were running an advisory business, but didn't have a portfolio. And now we're raising a fund while we're managing a growing portfolio and investing. And so just the, the constraints on time are different, but we know a lot more. We have more connections. So I don't know. It's We'll earn our stripes as tenacious. We'll earn our name uh, as tenacious, but that's what founders have to do too. On the, on the one hand, you're making me feel better about how I feel day to day as an emerging fund manager, but then also reminding me that it doesn't necessarily get any easier. <laughs> what about on the founder side, like the portfolio management side? Has that been easier or more difficult than you expected? Yeah, it's interesting. I love working with founders and couldn't do this, I think, if you if you didn't. And so that's been, it's been truly rewarding. Like the days that are the worst, you get kicked in the teeth by a bunch of investors, go visit one of your portfolio companies, and you can literally see the physical things come to life that were a PowerPoint deck two years ago. And it's, oh my God, like we're building a real thing. This is real. We're changing the world. And so there's absolutely nothing like that. And, and that's absolutely what I believe. It's been like, I think the, the balance of what role we play and where we can add advice and, and support is a really interesting one. We thought a lot about, okay, we don't want to be sort of commodity VC and do what all the other investors do because A, it's not differentiated, but B, others around the table will, will do that. And so where can we be more differentiated and double down on like our unique insights? But it turns out when you're leading an early stage round, like someone has to help with some of the fundamental stuff. If the founders have never set up a board before or have never raised other funds before, or those kinds of things. And so finding the right areas to step in on and then the right ways to systematize that. So we have a community of practice and have peer-to-peer -peer support. We have things that we've systematized and templatized and playbooked and, and that kind of stuff. But then sometimes it's just, you have to lean in and help and there's no one else around the table to do that. And so just finding the right balance of when and how, and they're running the companies, you absolutely want them to run the companies. But when you see the same challenges or opportunities over and over again, you want to step in and lend that advice. I would say that's always a an ongoing balance. So putting aside the raising of the capital, which which we can both agree that it's is a as a challenge outside of that is there are there things that turned out to be harder than you imagined and are there things that are easier than you imagined yeah one i, I literally have a post-it note over over my desk that says like just because they don't do it your way doesn't mean they won't do it and there's times where a founder is you feel like you're watching them drive the truck into the wall or off the road or they just wrote the thing this whatever but you're not in the business to run these companies for them, you back teams. And so if anything, think about what, how you do diligence and what kinds of questions you ask and how you support them because you're not running these companies. And then I've had the example where that same company that you're so frustrated with that they won't just do it the way you want them to or whatever, turns around and does it better than you ever thought they would and probably better than you would have done it. And you realize, great, I'm sitting in the right seat and so are they. And so there's definitely that balance of, yeah, expertise and advice you can add with absolute humility to say you're just not running these companies at the end of the day and you've backed the people who are. So that's that's always a fun one and, and a bit of a challenge at times. That one definitely resonates. So I think I might steal that post-it note. <laughs> I actually put that up because I have needed that reminder. And and equally your comment before when you when you're getting kicked in the teeth by your LPs or investors to go and spend time with a portfolio company. Actually Don and I had that experience a couple of months back. We were just in a, a little bit of a lull and, and had a lunch with a portfolio co and that just re-energized our souls to get back out and remind us why we're in this game and what we're doing. Totally. Yeah. And that community aspect is, is so important. Like, I think that's, I don't know if it's been easier, but it's been like as rewarding as I thought is like when we have our LP hangouts, we're pretty transparent with our LPs. They meet all our founders. We're like, we have literally what we call hangouts and, and they come on Zoom and, and we chat about trends and, and they meet companies. Um, and some of those discussions where it's like, you can just see the dots being connected between them. And one of our LPs is a farmer. And so he's got a swarm farm robot and like they're trialing it. And then that's having field days and another LP goes to them. And like that kind of community and insights. And yeah, just seeing that function. We always dreamed that it would, but seeing it be a reality is, is also really rewarding and has been super special. 
That's really interesting because for us, we've invested in two ag tech companies so far, but our investor base don't particularly understand ag or hardware. Are you, have you particularly targeted investors who understand the agricultural sector? It's interesting. I think we, for fun one, if I'm honest, we felt probably pressure to look more like a quote unquote normal VC. Not only was the fun model like, okay, it's, we're innovating by being sector specific. It was really early in Australia in terms of sector specific firms. We're impact focused. We don't come from finance. There's a bunch of sort of strange or, or novel things about us. So the model, it was like two and 20 venture cap, ESV, CLP, like venture capital don't innovate on that at all. And it probably meant that some of our language, like even down, I talked before about the thematics and we think about systems and how the agri-food system is changing. In our fund one IM, you can see we wrote, we will invest in robotics and autonomy and IOT because you're supposed to talk about technologies. And we will invest in from farm to fork because make it really simple. And, and it's, we just don't think like that. We don't think in linear ways. We don't think about the technology. We think about all the complexity and the nuance. And that's what makes us who we are. And we probably just didn't lean into that as much in fund one as we do now. And so I think the true believers that we have coming on board for fund two are like have come through that filter because we say so much more about it because we've actually done it now. And and some of that is our, our returns thesis isn't that everything is going to be a NASDAQ IPO. We think about M&As, we think about early exits, we think about non-dilutive funding, we're upfront about deep tech. And so some of that we always knew would be true, but we didn't have the language to talk about it in a way that was both true and authentic. And now we have more language around it. And so I think that might shift the LP base a little, but not substantially. We still have lots of, it's private capital, it's family offices and high net worths, lots of ag, lots of impact focus, but all financially, it's, it's non-concessionary impact. So kind of net net, I don't think it'll change it, but I think how we talk about it and how kind of people come on that journey with us probably has changed. And you, you mentioned about working to make a bit of a shift on the LP base, where, where are the areas that you think that they most have the wrong opinion or, or just aren't seeing the, the world uh, through the, the lens of opportunity? This, it's a little too early to tell because it won't, I, I don't think it'll end up shaking out like this, but as of now, we do have more or a lot more offshore interest than I expected for Fund 2. We have a, a kind of fam, US family office that's come in as an anchor for Fund 2. We have two European family offices, like looking at large checks. So I think that we didn't try it at all offshore for Fund 1, but I think Australia counter seasonal, really good at ag, climate variability, like there's a really strong case for ag in Australia. And if you're looking globally at ag, you can come to that conclusion. Sometimes when you're looking in Australia at venture, that's a harder conclusion to get to. And so that's something that we, it's an opportunity and a challenge for us. It's really interesting you say that. My, my view, I really feel like Australia could own the ag sector in this space, but I, but I don't think, feel we're there yet. Is that, is that a fair description? And, and, and what will it take? And do you see that future where we, we still see the charts where fintech is leading the way for investment in Australia? When will ag tech take over? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've stolen this expression from, from Matthew, my business partner, for sure. But if you think about what Australia naturally is good at, if we were, if there was the Olympics of, of things, okay, it, actually swimming in the Olympics, Australia would be on the podium. And then ag tech, we're like we're genuinely really world-class at it. And if there was the Olympics of venture, like ag tech should be on the top of that podium. We have natural advantages that go back decades, secondly, subsidized industry, highly export oriented, highly variable climate. Like there's really good reasons here for ag. Um, and I don't think we fully embrace that from an ag tech perspective. We still, especially from a political perspective, perspective think a lot about increasing food and fiber production, not commercializing the innovations that enable that food and fiber production. And it's such an untapped opportunity, which is why I've stayed in Australia. It's why we created Tenacious. Um, so we, we know we're true believers in that for sure. I had a, an investor tell me that he didn't like ag tech because it was too weather dependent, which <laughs> obviously doesn't make a huge amount of sense. So is, is, it, is it the role of VC to purely educate or are there different ways mm. to try and get people understanding that we're not talking about putting money into planting the crops we're talking about the whole supply chain yeah i would say there's definitely conversations like that that we have where the perception is that ag tech is selling software and hardware to farmers or like farming and a bit of a learning curve there we don't tend to get that too much probably just because by the time you're talking to us like generally agri-food or you come in through the climate door and so you've thought about adaptation and resilience and to your point about weather, we're going to have more 
volatile weather. And so how are we going to manage that? And what kinds of insurance products and what kinds of water retention products and biological inputs? And how's the whole system going to change as like, those are actually opportunities. But if you're, if you're coming from all the way back on what are we even talking about here, that can be a pretty steep one. Like I've definitely had those conversations where you just immediately realize talking to an LP that you're never going to get there because whatever perception they have of, of ag or ag tech or hardware, it's just too steep a hill to climb. And so then you try to have a good conversation and learn something and see if you can refer them to someone else that maybe is a better fit, but you're just never going to get there. How are you managing AI and the changing landscape in terms of, one is in terms of opportunity in the ag tech space, but also in terms of the current portfolio and the impact it might have on them? Yeah, it's it's a fascinating one. We sometimes there's days where I, I literally feel like I can the dinosaur claws are like growing out of my hands where just like the world is like moving faster than I can move and I'm like turning into the tar pit. And so we're just fighting that for ourselves in our portfolio because it does seem like it's moving so fast and especially this year. So we as a team are doing an AI, AI course right now in our um, community practice for our founders. <clears throat> We've had a couple of sessions on AI around again, how are they using it, like leveling up on best practices. So from a kind of productivity and then also from a business model integration perspective. And then on the podcast, which is a learning out loud forum for us talking to experts on cutting edge of different technologies, including AI. So we did an episode this year with the farmer on how he's using AI. Matthew's working on some episodes right now on like cutting edge of machine vision, weed detection, autonomy, robotics, like what's happening there. And we have the, the ever exciting excuse of, hey, we need to do a podcast episode on this. Hey, we need to learn about this. So let's do both at the same time. And yeah, I think that's something that the amount of data we collect in agriculture, the advice, the advisory relationships, like there's so many opportunities for how we do that. And I think in particular for ag, the user interface dynamics with farmers have been underinvested in. We talk about yield maps as just an affront to human visual, like you, how can you read one of those and know what you're meant to do? And so the conversational nature of, of cutting edge AI, like all of the ways we can interact, I think is going to really change things for agriculture, especially just given who some of the on-farm and in supply chain users are and the more native ways that we can interface with computers and humans together that's starting to get really exciting. So with, with that advent of AI, that means the founders are going to have to really start to adapt to change a lot more, going to have to maybe look at some of their products and technologies and, and throw them out and, and start again. How do you approach supporting founders in, in that decision making and, and almost having that culture and climate that allows them to, to not get wedded to yesterday so they can deal with tomorrow? I would say it's not unique to AI. Like if you're going on the founder journey, that adaptability is something that, well, I don't know, top five for sure, maybe top three characteristics. I was talking to one of our founders the other day and she was saying, we were talking about, oh, that's something you have to learn. And she's like, there's some days where I wish I didn't have to learn anything new. And, and I just love that because it was like, it's so characteristic of the founder journey where you're just like, another day of the fire hose. Here we go. And generally you love that, right? We're, we're curating people who want to take that on, who thrive in that environment. And I totally get it. There's days where you're like, can we just turn it off and have a little water fountain? And yes, you should, right? But I think that's not unique to AI. That's the kind of people that will be successful is that adaptability change, always learning, strong opinions, weekly held. And so for us, that's looking for that in our, as early as possible in our kind of investment process, getting to know people, behavioral interviews, that kind of thing. Where, where do you think investors sometimes uh, get due diligence wrong in terms of either filtering out companies that shouldn't be or filtering in companies that, that, that shouldn't be? Where, do you see any common patterns out there? Yeah, I'm not inside anyone else's brain, but the one where I get really mad at my brain is when I heard from a company done the work to first principles, figure out whether I'm excited about them or not. I have concluded that I'm not. And then at the end of the call, they're like, and so-and-so is in and so-and-so's in. And then my brain is, wait, this is actually a really good investment. And I'm like, no, no brain, you just, <laughs> you just did all the work to conclude that this is not a good investment. And now just because these other people are in, you want to change your mind. So that's one that I don't know if you guys, if you guys face that it's obviously what we coach founders to instill in us as investors to unlock the capital. But I find that very challenging, the whole social proof dynamics. And it's a challenge for us more seriously on the tenacious side, because we do consider ourselves and do the work to be thesis driven and we are sector specific. And so in some ways we're 
like too easy to pitch to because if you're in an area that we've already done the work on that we already love, we sometimes fail to think more about who else, or at least we've made this mistake before, who else is going to come on this journey? Who else is going to like it? What's your fundraising kind of aptitude? Who are the co-investors? And so early on, we learned a lot that we needed to think more about capital requirements, who else would be around the table? How were they at fundraising? What support would they need early? Those kinds of things, because yeah, we found that we were probably too easy to pitch to sometimes and just being sector specific. We, we, we sometimes try and review our anti-portfolio of the ones that we said no to that ended up being great successes. Have you got any of those and did you work out why you had said no and, and would you still hold to that decision or was there something maybe that you didn't see? I love this question. It, it's still too early to tell, honestly, for us. So there are definitely companies that we passed on that have gone on to raise well. And so on paper, they look like strong misses for us. They are ones that we passed on though, and it's hard to tell. Like it, we are on paper performance might look better than it does now in a few cases. And so there's times where raising fun to you're like, oh, I just, those would be great ones to have. But genuinely we looked and passed and for reasons that we still think hold true. So be interesting to see. We've also had cases, this was a good learning from fund one, only formed under um, the ESVCLP structure, which means 20% um, kind of safe harbor for non-Australian. And because we're already sector specific and then the dynamics of ag, we had examples of US companies operating very significantly in Australia, European companies, French companies setting up in Australia to work or whatever that we got to know, had sourced, had went and met with potential acquirers of theirs, talked them up and were able to create lots of value, but we're not able to capture it. And so for us, a refinement to the fund two strategy is around like strategic to Australia but not limited to HQ in Australia. And so I think that in terms of portfolio construction, anti-portfolio and learning has been one of the big ones is just having the flexibility to take full advantage of the opportunities that we source and, and not having that be too constraining. That, that's really interesting. Our focus is B2B tech leaving Australia, heading into the UK and US. Well, not leaving Australia, but scaling into the UK or US markets. And just by virtue of our networks and that positioning, we ended up with a lot of inbound investment opportunity from the UK in particular that's looking to expand into Australia. And we considered it for a while, but ended up, we really want to stay focused on our, our niche, which is adding the value the other way. I, I, that was a long way of asking, in terms of the support that you offer the companies and going back to what you were talking about before, what, what is it unique to Tenacious? What, what is the unique value add beyond the capital? Because that's obviously a core part of your, your value prop and, and differentiation. Yeah. Whenever we get asked this by potential investors, it's we'll give you our answer, but talk to our companies. And I genuinely think that no investor should get to answer that without a founder testimonial that kind of comes with it because everyone says, oh, we add all this value. So a couple of examples, I think for us, there's a, a lot of the normal stuff that VCs do, like definitely doubling down on fundraising. And because it's deep tech and there's only so many investors in Australia who also will be willing to invest in deep tech. It's absolutely on us to have those networks uh, on and offshore that will be interested in materials for packaging or a livestock genetic improvement platform or on-farm autonomy. And those aren't the same investors. So our co-investor networks and thinking about that downstream capital. We also have a lot of like industries expert and domain experts. So scientists, researcher, farmer, et cetera, founders who are often first time entrepreneurs. And so again, just the fluency with fundraising and how it works and those kinds of things. So those are two and, and we get pretty in the weeds, templates for data rooms and pitch coaching. And there's lots of kind of hands-on support that we provide there. And then on the full other end of the spectrum would be like agri-food, go-to-market, strategy. Who are the incumbents? What is What are the kind of milestones you'd need to hit to unlock a strategic acquisition? How are the tectonic plates shifting in crop protection? And what is transition from chemical to biological going to look like? And whose crosshairs are you going to get into? And that would be like the other side where it's strategic kind of industry specific, go to market, exit pathways, those kinds of things. So yeah, two examples. I think for me being relatively new to VC, we're in year, just over year two now. And learning about the different ways that management can play out in, in, in terms of managing portfolio and decision making, I'm really curious how you and Matthew operate and perhaps more moments where you might disagree on things. How do you actually manage that? How do you manage the, yeah. Yeah, the disagreements or the not a, not a clear path forward? So someone was telling me the other day that the incidence of GP to GP 
fighting slash breakups is like ridiculously high, which terrified me. I was like, I don't know, Matthew and I are like really values aligned and we get on like, we should fight more. Like we're not, I don't know what's coming down the pathway. But genuinely we were in the fortunate position of getting to know each other for a while through the ecosystem. And then Matthew joined the advisory business that I had founded. And so we worked together initially with him as a consultant and then I'm coming on board as a partner. And so we had worked together to, to build something before we decided to found Tenacious. And I think that was really valuable, but also meant tough conversations about him coming into an existing business. So equity and salary, and we're at different stages of our life with different personal journeys. And so we, we were, I think, very fortunate in having to have early tough conversations, which laid really strong groundwork for when we disagree on different levels of conviction around an investment or how we should support a founder or, or, or those kinds of things. And no shying away from those like robust discussions, but I think we're it's been really important to have super similar values. And I just keep coming back to that whenever things are tough or I see other co-founders fighting that we align in the mission we're trying to achieve, but things like self-awareness, always be learning, tenacity, we both love to work. So there's lots of kind of alignment in, in just who we are as people. And that's, I think, pretty, pretty important foundations as well. Yeah, I, I try and tell our portfolio that please don't put us on a pedestal because we're in the same journey as you totally. are, and and we have the same interpersonal relationships that we have to develop and maintain and, and go through all the same challenges in parallel with you, even though we are investors. And I, I think it's important that our founders and shareholders understand that we're not immune to those things and therefore we ourselves have to invest heavily in that alignment and, and uh, everything you just said. Yeah, totally. sorry, I mean, right. I don't know how I could work in venture without having had to be on the other side of the table, like truly in, in all the senses of the word. And they talk about you need operating experience, you need this and that, all of which is, is useful, but especially given how much a venture is dictated by fundraising, like you just don't preserve the right to stay alive, that it's so important to me to have had to fundraise our own fund because you just know so much about what like getting treated like an asshole, like just people suck in some ways. And just, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to do it like that. And also I just know how it feels to just get completely ghosted or to have someone just not be listening or to feel like people just sent you a BS response. And yeah, just that exact empathy for the other side of the table and also transparency that we're going through it too. One of the things that our COO Vela put in our like onboarding deck for portfolio companies was a bit about how this is a true partnership and we're not going to sit here and tell you like, we're just going to do everything to enable you. And we have this whole support and we're just totally going to help you. And everything's about you. And it's sometimes we're going to ask you for reporting and it's going to suck because you're going to be busy and we're going to need that data from you. And we're going to chase you for it and you're going to hate it. But that's what a partnership is. And so part of this deal is us being in partnership together. And so I really appreciated that things like that, where we can manage expectations. Yes. But set out what working together is really going to be like. Yeah. I love that. It's setting those early expectations. Absolutely. Do you guys, can I ask you a question back? Do you guys have any tips on, on strengthening and continuing to invest in the, in the co-founder and general partner relationships? What do you guys do to keep that strong? <laughs> this is a really good question. So between Don and I, we've known each other for a while before getting involved in, in Tribe together. And I think part, part of the way that we came together and got to know each other, I think highlighted shared values definitely, but this, this shared interest in learning and discovering things about ourselves and being actually quite open and transparent to talking about our, our weaknesses and shortfallings. And then more recently, we do things like decide to run a marathon and go through the comparative training programs and all the little nuances of our behaviors that come out through that. But it, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic. This is an area that, that Don and I spend a lot of time thinking about with the portfolio codes and, and founder relationships there. And with our, you know, our shareholders, we have shareholders in our management company and managing those relationships there. So yeah, there's, there's no one magic tip. I love what? that though, like shared activities and doing stuff together and building that who each other are in through lived experience. You can't like talk about it to figure out who someone is. So whether that's a marathon or working together, both ideally. Yeah. And, and yeah, because we've got such respect for each other, you don't talk about who won the marathon or... <laughs> or... There is no need to bring any of that. We, we keep arrogance, arrogance out of, <laughs> out of the equation relationship. But, but really it comes down to, to, to me, there's 
shared mission, values, all of those things that are reasonably easy to talk about. The, the challenge is until you're in the trenches, it's a bit a bit hard to really understand those. And, and I don't know your perspective, but we still haven't totally solved for evaluating that with our investments because you can you can go out to dinner and and we can spend a lot of time we can have a whole lot of conversations and what we try and do is we run these off sites four times a year and and we also take people on missions and you you try and really spend that time with them but actually until you're in a stressed situation and you give people opportunity to default to form it's actually really hard to understand what they value and therefore what behavior that value is gonna drive. So still a work in progress. Absolutely. I think if there was some way to short circuit that, like everyone, you'd have different whole investment dynamics. And yeah, there's interesting, it raises for me, this is a rabbit hole, you guys don't have to go down if you don't want to, but interesting questions around like bias too and what activities people tend to do together and what's sort of suitable for business. And I'm, I know that I'm really lucky and that I've played sports my whole life. I always play sports. And so business wise, it's always it, like, I can go to venture squash and I can, I can just do stuff like that. And then you build relationships with people and you see importantly, is someone a shitty loser? Does someone come like all, all those kind of things you learn in a stressed situation in this artificial world of sports. And that does translate to business, but not everyone plays sports. And so what does that mean? And can you do that over a glass of wine, but not even drinks. And some people have kids. And so I think it just raises really interesting questions of you can't short circuit this stuff. It's so important, but the kind of established ways of doing it also can be problematic too. So pretty, pretty tricky one to solve. Yeah. But I I do love that sport aspect for me. Look, being part of groups that have gone on adventures and, and those sort of physical challenges, which are really uncomfortable. And for us, there is a little bit of the way we structure, particularly our, our missions, where you know, participants don't have a lot of information in advance. They are long days. They're exhausting. There's a lot of time on feet, so physically tired. There's a, there's a kind of like an emotional journey we take the participants through in terms of shock and awe of a new market. And, and so you do start to see some characteristics come out. But, but yeah, until, until someone's truly tested, we can all state a certain set of values or state a certain intent or, or state a mission of that, but, but it, it's when it comes it, down to it. And it depends on what the vision and mission and what the relationship is and what you're, what you're yeah. seeking, all, all of those things. But ultimately, that underlying, what, what do I value most? And I think there's not really a right or wrong. There just is some situations work and some situations don't. And from an investment slash founder perspective, we're in the game of trying to be not only contrarian but right. And if if good ideas, lots of capital and a great go-to-market strategy was sufficient, more of these founders would be successful. But the reality is in a lot of circumstances, they trip over themselves. Yeah. It's interesting. When I went to grad school, the onboarding week was you, you did a series of challenges. And one of the challenges was this robotics challenge and you had to build a robot and you'd get different clues throughout the week and the judges would pull the rug out from under you and it changed the thing. And it's actually doing two hours instead of 12. And you're like the, exactly designed to um, help you at the end, pick like who's going to be your core teammates for the like core part of the course. And I just remember coming out of that learning so much about myself and my own strengths and weaknesses. And it was pretty obvious pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be the ones building the robots. Like I had an engineering degree, but it just was not my skill set. But figuring out cross team coordination of the shared challenges we had that we could all solve together, I immediately went there and various leadership, they they were just, that became obvious to me then who I was and who I wanted to work with and what skill sets I didn't have that I needed to sure up. And I wish that we could do things like that. So I love the idea of these adventures that you take founders on or, or missions and things, because that time together and d- duress, but not duress is, is so important to tease that out. Yeah. The, the, one of the big things that we constantly talk about throughout the podcast or internally is this, this rather nebulous concept of trust and respect. You, you find me a, a team that is hitting its straps and, and swinging between problems like an entrepreneurial Tarzan, of, you'll find deep trust and respect. And, and the reason we need that deep trust and respect is because conflict is inevitable. It's, it's not like we can choose no conflict. We're going to have conflict. The only 
the only discussion is, is it going to be constructive conflict or is it going to be destructive conflict? And so a lot of the work we're doing in DD and, and post investment support is how do we get a team of people maintaining trust and respect in the face of an environment that is designed to erode trust and respect? And the problem with trust and respect is it's actually the outcome of a range of other ingredients. And if those ingredients exist, then we're good. If those ingredients are absent and, and some of the ingredients are that vision and mission that, that we've been discussing, but vision and mission has to be underpinned by values. But even if you have a strong vision and mission with good values, if you don't have the right structures, right in terms of authority, responsibility, rewards, information systems, it's really hard to get greatness out of people. And what we want to try and do, at least at the portfolio level, is how do you take extraordinary people and have them achieve extra, sorry, ordinary people and have them achieve extraordinary results. If you can have a structure that is perfectly designed for a mission and vision so we don't have those conflicts and the, and we have values to underpin that, it's not going to be easy, but you're at least a little bit ahead of people that don't have the same vision and mission or at least fall out with the vision and mission or a structure that's got cracks in it in day one. So it's, it's a little bit nebulous, but there's, those are the areas that we try and concentrate on rather than being two domain expertise. It's up for the founders to try and sort that shit out. <laughs> I love it. It was interesting. I was on a um, panel the other day and the audience asked the panel, so other than returns, why are you in it? And my co-panelist was like, what do you mean? There is nothing else. And and I, I thought it was really interesting because for us, it, it truly is returns and impact. And it's not only part of my DNA and Tenacious's DNA, but I think it's part of our founders DNA too. And we really want to understand what gets them out of bed in the morning and when it gets tough, where do they go to? And I think sometimes that well, we've seen, not even I think that that broader mission of solving a, a global challenge or an environmental challenge, often in the case of climate, does keep them coming back for more when, when it's really tough and it brings the talent around them and the team. And we've had them, we've had teams have to forego payroll because a round was closing late, like stuff like that. That's really genuinely tough or let people go or whatever, just tough decisions and having that bigger piece that they're all on board. That's not just make more money. We've just seen be so key. I think all of that's 100%. And, and the, the only challenge becomes that day one, we'll often find there's all that alignment but then because life changes and people's perspective changes and kids come along and you know, all that shit, the problem is that sometimes that starts to disintegrate and falls apart. And so it's, it's how do you help them stay true to that passion and energy that, that I think can often be the big challenge. Yeah, totally. Like how deep can you, is it, is it really in their DNA or is it like the thing that they care about right now? And yeah. when, when it, when that DNA part of its question, because of life happens, what, what's there. And it's, it's basically impossible to know that in the limited time we have to know to get before we invest in founders, but, but that getting a better sense of that is absolutely part of the deal. Yeah. I think your founders were purely motivated by a financial gain. There are certainly easier ways to make money than, than what they <laughs> sign up for. <laughs> Sarah, one of the things that's always stood out for me with you, I, I feel like I, I knew you before I think we jumped on a call for, for Swarm Farm, and that's because of your, your content, your writing. W was that a strategic decision to be tent driven or was it something more just for yourself to process it as a force mechanism for learning? But can you just talk through what, what was the content strategy? Yeah, it started when I ran the advisory business, Authentic, before Tenacious existed, when I so when I moved to Australia, I didn't know anyone here. And that sort of forced me to figure out how I would figure out what I was going to do next. And I had just come out of a my master's program where I'd written a thesis. And so I just come off of this like intensive writing period. And the third leg of that stool is my partner, my other half is worked at HubSpot for many years. And their whole thing has been you know, inbound marketing and content. And so it was just three things that came together of I need to build a new network expertise, figure out what's going on in Australia. I have things to say because I just interviewed 70 agri-food impact investors across the world. We're the only kind of 70 that existed 10 years ago. And I feel like I have insights about that. And supposedly this inbound marketing thing, content is where the future is going. And that led to, okay, a commitment of before before I, this advisory business exists, I've got one client, I'll write a blog post a week. And so I started with that. And then every time I go to a conference, I'll write up what I learned. And then just a few kind of, I'm a big believer in like set 
standards, not goals. And so it's going to be a blog a week or, or those kinds of things. And I just saw so quickly the benefit of it, like just absolutely. And in the advisory world, it's, it's easier because you're measured by, okay, leads come in the door and do they turn into contracts and do you do consulting or advisory work or not? But it just, it really worked. And then invitations to speak and then paid speaking gigs and then reputation and then credibility and then more intros. And you could just see the loop spinning. And so I just became absolutely a true believer and it's evolved to not just a like funnel or anything like that, but more what you say is a forcing function to process my thoughts and to learn out loud. So whether that's more on like the journey we're on, like the fundraising stuff, I just, it was so frustrating to me that venture was such a black box that I wanted to try to do something about it and open up to founders about what it's like to be an investor and share that this is what it's like on this side of the table and then open up to LPs about what their behaviors might lead to and unintended and intended consequences and those kinds of things. And then on the more like industry side, it's, I think part of our thesis development work is having those conversations through the podcast and writing about them. And I also like it. I like putting all the things in their places. And so doing the synthesis and analysis work, I enjoy doing too. And if it was all just like strategy and some persona I'm trying to be like, I, it's too much work to do that. So you have to like it as well, which I do. One of the things we often talk about is you know, we're not big, we're not writing big enough checks to, to buy a seat. We, we have to earn our influence. And I, would it be fair to say that a lot of your content writing and that transparency through your, your blog posts has earned you that influence and you're able to have a greater influence with the portfolio case because of that? I think absolutely. And again, you have to ask them. It's definitely played a role now that we've been doing it for long enough, 150 plus episodes on the podcast and things like that, where I can truly walk into rooms in other countries in our niche of ag and climate, but still, and people go, I listened to that episode. I know who you are from this. You should meet this person. And even whether that becomes something business-wise or not, it's just like, humans are cool and that you get to meet like super interesting people from other countries that are care about the same shit you do is, is amazing. But it's also led to, we followed your work for a long time. We weren't fund one investors, but now we're interested in fund two or companies that have said, we know that content is going to be part of our business strategy or your sector specific insights or your networks or so it's definitely had strategic benefits all the way to the point of someone like literally filling out the form on the website and then becoming an LP with a big check like it's it has a whole range of kind of tangible and intangible benefits you've given me great confidence that that is possible <laughs> all no, but I, think gotta, no. I think I think you gotta love it because we're only episode 29 into our little podcasts and then with the with the blogs but just with with the personalities if we didn't really enjoy learning engaging with others giving platforms to others you, you just I don't think people realize that for every hour of recorded content they're listening to some idiot has had to spend three four five hours <laughs> shaping shaping that up indeed it truly started the podcast specifically because I was, I didn't know how to talk to farmers and I wanted to, I was like, this is so key. And I just like perceive this rural urban divide or especially in Australia. And I just didn't. And so it was like somehow the idea of being like, Hey, I saw you speak on this panel. These two insights were interesting. Will you come on my podcast was easier than just like small talk. And so that was like a big motivator in the early days of, of why podcast. And then it was like, this is awesome because you learn a ton and it has all those other benefits too. And so with, with a lot of your writing and even the podcast reflecting on a range of things, I appreciate you very early into the, into the funds, but w when things aren't working out to plan or to thesis, are there some common patterns as to, as to why that is? Like for us, sometimes it's go to market or our definition of product market fit just turned out to be some really excited early adopters that actually can't break scale across that chasm of death and any patterns or reflections there through your writing and podcasting? Yeah, I would say so one, like we think about because we invest in deep tech, there's technical risk and then market risk. And so if we're going to take technical risk, how do we not take market risk? That's easy to say, but what does it mean to not take market risk when the cup, when the thing hasn't been built yet? And so lots of refinement and learnings there. One of the frameworks that we found really helpful in doing customer diligence is like awareness versus comparison. And if we talk to customers who this was the first time someone drove up the driveway or called them or whatever, and made them aware that there was a solution to this problem that they have, that's really different than like a qualified customer who's gone and searched the market and picked this solution and simple kind of 
heuristics and frameworks like that to help us figure out whether there is what to what degree of market risk is there. And then of course, the technical risk side is, is a whole different set of assessment. But I think that's, you know, an example where we've had to get better at assessing not just do we believe that the macro picture is aligned to this trend and if this widget's built it will unlock it but specifically the micro like who's going to pay for it and when and why and if we don't really understand that and they don't really understand that there's probably too much market risk and and that's where we can get in trouble and, and in that how much financial modeling do you do or is it more going deeper on like you were saying on, on that understanding that the product market fits on yeah i would say it's there's obviously some financial modeling returns and projections and things like that, but it's not the kind of core part of what we would do in our diligence. I would say a lot of it is um, understanding on the, on that market side what are the kind of bottom up assumptions that would build that model. Like who are the customers? Who's actually in the pipeline? We're not talking, especially in these early stages, about some funnel of thousands of leads. Right? It's like they've got a handful of pilots or, or something like that. And are those pilot customers piloting with company X because? Company X was the first one that came along and said, we have a better way to do it or because they had really searched and there's something unique about Company X and what kind of engagement is it? They're sending them some samples and there's a bit of co-validation or is it like, no, no, we're already starting to change how our operations working and making capital investments in how our farms are planted, how our factories are set up, the kind of hires we're making because we're so committed to this technology coming online that we can see this future and we're already investing in it. So things like that are, I would say, where we spend more time. And, and for founders listening, are there are there things that you think some founders think are important, but maybe aren't important, and they over anchor on on that that you you find as a broad pattern? All the I hate those moments. You guys maybe have had them too. When like things that you wish weren't true about venture capital prove to be true about venture capital. The 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 Silicon Valley skit that's like revenue don't have revenue, yeah, and yeah. then you like wish you're like that can't possibly be true. And then you're like, oh my God, it's true. How, why is that true? And obviously it's because that's a great show and they've observed the things and I haven't been in this industry for 20 years, but like, why is literally, why is that true? Shouldn't some revenue be better than none? And so there's things like that, that are probably the human psychology of investors that founders underappreciate, like the social proof and FOMO and, and those kinds of things. I would say the mistake we often see is just not investing enough in fundraising because these found, you know, founders want to build their business because they want to make the thing come to life and build the team and realize the mission and see the impact in the world and work with the customers to help them. And this whole part of investing, it's, it's I'll go raise and then I'll go through the post-raise hangover, which is a real thing. And then I'll get back to building my company. And it's just not true. I think we would say at any given time, you're spending 30 to 150% of your time fundraising if you're a founder. And that is a staggering stat to most founders. And I wish it wasn't true, but I think it has to be. And and getting them ready for that post-raise hangover. And for us often, it's also our LPs because it is absolutely a, a true thing. And, and the amount of times I've seen some investors then handle that post-raise hangover poorly, which then creates some cultural challenges that then perpetuates a longer hangover, I, I find really bizarre that some investors haven't worked out that pattern yet. I'm like chomping at the bit to ask you for an example, but it's not my podcast, so I won't, but I, I deeply empathize with that. I think like accepting the journey that the founders are on and finding ways to support them is to your point well, an opportunity well, the, the to The common trust. example is just that first board meeting and the numbers the numbers come in short and there's all this surprise and, and, and angst and what are you going to do, whereas... What we try and do, as long as we've, what we've changed our process for is because we're not writing big enough checks for a board position. And from a scalability point of view, nor are we trying to build a fund that relies on that. But what we do try and have is a side letter that just says, look, within the first 30 days, you're going to commit to a workshop with us. Because one of the things that we try and normalize early is that actually problems are a core part of life. The problem isn't the problem. The problem is, is this normal? Is this abnormal or is this fatal? And we try and get teams of people realizing the problems are actually a really good thing. We've just got to know what sequence to handle them in. And often some of the problems are around that post-investment hangover where so much of that energy has come through. And we'll often find ourselves providing a bit of an insulating layer 
between the founders and the other investors that may not have come from the founder's journey or may not have that empathy and are, have come from MBA spreadsheets. And that's just a disaster. Yeah, absolutely. The world where I think I actually heard this on a panel. It was a few years ago. One of the investors on the, on the panel said, when, when one of our portfolio companies hits their targets for the first six to nine months, we just preempt their next round because it's so rare. And I was like, that again, I just think founders don't know that, right? Like founders don't know that that's how investors think and that the likelihood that all the things that you've been telling us for this whole fundraising process, like we basically just don't think that that's going to happen. And okay, why don't we have that conversation with founders and say, let's take the pressure off for a second because we've already discounted these assumptions. Here's how we think this is going to go. Let's talk about how we outperform in the long term, but except just let's have that conversation. So yeah, totally, I don't know. <laughs> totally, to totally agree with you. Yeah, it's a, I, it's a fascinating area. I love that. I, I think we need the blog post that I wish it wasn't true for VC. Like that, <laughs> yes. that needs to exist. Uh, Let's write it. As a pin post. At least two, yeah. Yeah. Sarah, very conscious of time and you've been very generous with your time with us. But I, I'm, before we let you go, I'm keen to hear the, the vision for Tenacious, let's say for 15 years from now. Where's mm, Tenacious I, heading? I love it. I love that question. And... As we're fundraising, it, it sounds to me that not enough or that not many investors ask that to us, whereas you can't really imagine not asking that of a founder about their company. So it's truly about ag its interventions in, in agri-food. And so I don't think for a tenacious, we'll follow the quote unquote traditional venture path of fund one and then fund two, and then maybe raise a growth fund or an opportunity fund and then scale. We are committed to saying sector specific and, and focused on the climate challenges. And so I think the expansion pathways for us are like, it won't be other sectors. So is it stage? Probably not because we have an early exit thesis around M&A. So then you're left with like geography and like tools in the toolkit or type of capital. And the one we're looking at next, so for 15 years would be kind of tools in the toolkit. So probably fund three might look more like a debt fund or, or something like that to support the set of tools that agri-food tech founders need to scale up. And so that's probably the most likely kind of dimension of expansion for us. Geography is, is also something we, we think a lot about. And is it teaming up with other agri-food funds in the Southern Hemisphere? Is it us repeating the Australian kind of ecosystem development playbook in another strategic geography? Those are the kind of things we think about as well. But those are really the two key dimensions of expansion for us. Awesome. Yeah, super interesting. We, we, yeah, we love what you're doing. I think you guys are the out, out in front by an absolute mile of the emerging fund managers in terms of quality of brand, quality of output performance. So we, we absolutely love what you're, what you're doing. Thank you. That is lovely to hear. And I hope you tell all your guests that because it feels really nice. <laughs> only the ones that have earned it yeah only <laughs> the ones where it's actually true this isn't the feel good podcast <laughs> just keeping. also we'll, we'll have to go for a run next time we're in the same place I'm a poor runner now but a, a keen runner so it sounds oh. like I'll, I'll lag behind you guys I've always uh, been a poor runner so yeah. as long as you stay poor then I think we're alright yeah our, our variability of keenness might fluctuate but the poorness remains it's just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm in that sounds good <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you thank so you much. Thank you, guys.